Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner. I'm the director of the Global Bio-Risk Advisory Council, a division of ISSA. Now today I'm going to talk to you about some things we've been doing this year and also in previous years when it comes to dealing with cancer patients and infectious diseases. I'm going to outline and talk to you about our GBAC STAR program. And I'm also going to talk to you and give you an overview of what's being done to get people's homes, their households ready not just for COVID-19 or the coronavirus disease, but any infectious agent, any, envir any virus or any bacteria. And we're going to really focus on cleaning and disinfecting and how to create a safe home or a safe building. We're dealing with an unseen enemy and that unseen enemy is a virus or a bacteria. And my job is to help you identify where that unseen enemy might be within your home. And so we take, we're taking the, the invisible and we're making it visible because we know that no matter whether we're working with cancer patients or any other patients that may be immunocompromised, we know why and how that is done. And we have to do a lot better work and a lot better job of explaining what are the risks. Why are we so concerned? We know how chemotherapy increases anyone's risk for infections. The chemotherapy drugs that are used to treat cancer by killing the fastest growing cells in the body, both good cells and cancer cells. We know that neutropenia is a side effect of chemotherapy. And that means your body has fewer than normal infection fighting white blood cells. And we know that infection is when germs like viruses or bacteria enter your body and cause illness. Now, the fact that neutropenia does exist, it's a real thing, it lowers your immunity and again, can increase your uh, risk or your vulnerability to infection. What we also know is how COVID-19 spreads or any other viral disease for that matter. We know that it spreads person to person. Airborne transmission, droplets come out of our mouth. When we talk, we sing, we speak, we breathe. We know that services can be contaminated. We know that this virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 can survive outside of the body, not just for hours, but for days. But what we also know is that there are people within our communities, within our neighborhoods, that are at, at increased risk for severe illness. Adults of any age, and here's a, here's a list from the US Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, adults of any age with the following conditions are at increased risk of severe illness from the virus. So the work that we do at ISSA through the GBAC team, the GBAC STAR program, is not just focusing on cancer patients, but any other people within our community, our neighborhoods, our loved ones, our friends, our social groups that could be having or have these underlying medical conditions. And the fact is that we have to approach this by identifying the risk. And I hear that word used a lot when it comes to looking at people that have these illnesses and have all these conditions and have to deal with them. And the people say, well, you have to understand the level of risk, but what really is risk? And we really, all of us should be on the same page when it comes to what is risk? And risk is a function of both the likelihood of something happening and the consequences of it, if that ever, of it happening, of it, if it happens. So risk is a function of both the likelihood of something happening and a consequence of if it happens. Now that likelihood is, what are the chances of something happening? The consequences can be defined as, is how bad can it be if it actually happens? And what's really interesting is that as I talk to many people, and I work in hospitals and nursing homes within communities when it comes to infectious diseases, and I talk to a lot of patients, they talk about risk, but what's really important is we need to learn how to visualize risk. And at ISSA, our GBAC team has developed a matrix like this, where we're able to rate our risk, rate your risk from high to low. So you might identify the activity, and we might, we might turn that as a hazard. And then we look at, at our definition, the likelihood and the consequence. And now on a matrix like this, a risk matrix like this, we can measure likelihood as low, medium, high, consequence as low, medium, high. And we know that if we put a star or a cross in any of those red rectangles, then we either don't do that act activity, we avoid it, or we have to come up with a solution to decrease the risk so it comes back down and it's lower to, into the green rectangles. 
And it's really important as we go about our day-to-day -day activities, not, not just to say, it's not to just say we're not going to do that, but actually to conduct our own individual risk assessments. Because we have to consider whatever we do, wherever we go, whatever time of day it is, what's the likelihood of getting infected if I do this? But more importantly, what can I do to protect myself from being infected? So what can be done to prevent or minimize bad outcomes? And what's so important about this whole process is, do I make the best guess? No. What we do, and this is how our, our, the GBAC team works, everything we do is based on evidence. It's based on the best available information and data that we have. We try at all costs to avoid guessing. But we've been here before. It's not just the first time we've started working with, uh, in a situation like COVID-19 with an outbreak of a new or novel disease that has no vaccine and no cure. We've had lots of experience over the years working with tuberculosis, measles, hepatitis, influenza, norovirus, or any other infectious disease agents. Back in 2014, we all worked um, both in West Africa, but also here in the US with US patients in hospitals with Ebola, another disease like COVID-19 with no vaccine and no cure. And again, whenever we work with any infectious disease agent, be a virus or a bacteria, the US CDC or the World Health Organization issues documents. And the new CDC e Ebola guidelines that came out in, in 2014 were 30 pages long. It took a lot of interpretation, understanding, education to read those 30, 30 pages and interpret what action should I take? What should I do to create, to make a, my home safer, to decrease the risk or the likelihood of me getting infected? And that's what we do at GBAC. We take those documents, all those pieces of paper, the websites, and we interpret them into real actions, real world actions that can decrease the risk where you live in your home. And again, there's other things we, that we deal with from other government agencies or other regulatory bodies, or even just other organizations as they provide advice and guidelines. For example, if the FDA, FDA a US government agency, grants permission to use certain machines, you have to interpret what does that actually mean? How do we know how to use them properly? How do we develop training programs? How do we ensure that people have the education, both the user, the implementer, as well as the patient, understands that what we're doing is safe and effective. So all of us, whether you're a cancer patient living at home or we're working in, uh, in a, a, a hospital or a nursing home, or we're leaving our home to go to, to go to another place, whatever we do, every activity, every action we do, we need to do our own risk assessments. It's all about protecting yourself. Repeated, situation-specific risk assessments and management. We need to take a mental pause every time we move into a, another room, another building, another environment. Okay, what's the situation? Conduct our assessment. Am I protected for this situation? If yes, then you can do that activity. If no, what do I need to do to protect myself, to decrease my risk or my likelihood of being exposed to this environment, of this, to being exposed to this virus and getting infected? One of the simplest things you can do is cover your holes. We call that covering your holes by protecting your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. If you've got the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, or Ebola virus, for example, on your skin, would you get sick and infected? No, you'd wash it off with soap and water, because even soap and water will kill those viruses. But more importantly, knowing the how the, this, these viruses are transmitted, we know that it has to get inside our body to infect us and make us sick. And we know we have to protect our eyes, our nose and our mouth. So now that we know how we get sick, we know the vulnerabilities, we know how the virus is spread, I'm going to outline seven things you can do. You may have already done these. Some of you may have not. Some of you may have only done part of them, but how to create a household plan of action for COVID-19, but more importantly, for any other infectious disease agent, virus or bacteria, or any other pathogen. So let's go through those seven things that you can easily do. First one, talk with people. 
who need to be in your plan. Your family, your loved ones, your neighbors, your social group. People need to know how they can help. One of the biggest challenges I have when I work in hospitals is that the community wants to help. And often when I work in an emergency or disaster, when the community wants to help, what's the first thing they always give me is food. And often we have too much food. Where, where I, if I actually told them how they could help and gave them some direction, they'd be able to expend their energies and the resources in, in many, more meaningful ways. So talk to people, show them your plan. Get to know your neighbors so they understand your situation. They understand your behavior. They understand what you're worried about, what you need to do, how they can interact with you safely, how they can help you safely. So work this out with those that live closest to you. Within your community, you could identify aid organizations. And often we depend depending on, you know, but on but what particular disease a patient may have, whether it be tuberculosis, whether it be hepatitis, whether it be cancer as a, as a condition. We often align ourselves with those organizations that have that terminology, that name of that condition in their title. But there's many other, I wanna emphasize, there's many other organizations out there that could actually help you in many different ways, in delivering meals, in providing cleaning services, in doing yard work. Create an emergency contact list and ensure that that Emergency contact list is easy to find. Other people have copies and they know what they need to do under certain situations and share that list with others. But we can also go back to your home and where you live and we can look at a floor plan and we can look at a floor plan of where you live at home and where those areas of your house are safe areas, areas that we want to avoid outside people, maybe even family members from coming into a particular room and we can decrease the likelihood of it being infected with virus and therefore we, we maintain it at a safe level. You may also want to map out your room and look at a, a floor plan like this and identify where if someone in my family got sick, where would I put them? How would, they, how would we keep that separation until they got better to ensure that I could protect myself? So it's really important that you start to plan within your house, within the design, the floor plan, the movement, the areas that we touch often. How are we going to clean and disinfect those? How are we going to move around the house when we have to clean and, clean and disinfect maybe the whole house? And how often do we do that? Well, and that's all part of your plan. Plan how to care, medications. In 2019, it might've been reasonable for us to have medications maybe that lasts us for four weeks. But is it possible we can talk to our, our physician, our insurance company and get maybe medications that are pre prescribed for maybe two months, three months for a longer period of time? Is there better ways that we can, we can order those medications online without having to go into a CVS or Walgreens? Are there other members of, the members of our community in our neighborhood that could help us pick up our prescriptions? Plan how to care for food. Of all the cancer patients that I've been working with this year, grocery shopping has been a big concern, a big worry. How do we get around that? How do we avoid crowds? How do we avoid uh, indoor spaces and, and where we, the ventilation or the cleaning disinfection might not be at a standard that decreases the risk? How do we ensure supply of nutritious food when we're trying to restrict our movement outside our home or we don't even want to leave our home because of the cases of say COVID-19 within our neighborhood or our community. How do we arrange that? How would we actually have a plan to ensure that we can receive food on a regular basis? And then go leads into fluids and how important it is to maintain supplies of fluids. And how do we ensure that we have that in our home? Do we have areas of extra storage areas where we can put extra fluids and store them? Whether we're, if we're not just relying on water that comes out of a faucet, but we're relying on drinks that come out of bottles. How do we maintain that supply? Some of us are very fortunate in that we have two bathrooms. Many of us live in houses or apartments where we only have one bathroom. How do we maneuver and clean and disinfect, but manage a bathroom when there's other people living with us? Do we let visitors or outside people outside of our home use our bathroom? What, what other precautions do we have? One thing I'd like to recommend to all of you is that if you come to my bathroom, I don't keep my hairbrush, my toothbrush, or any other 
uh, hygiene or personal items in my bathroom. I keep them in a separate area away from my bathroom because we know and we have evidence, we have documents, we have case studies where contamination can occur on those personal items that are kept in your bathroom. So if you've got personal items in your bathroom today, I would highly recommend and suggest that is there somewhere else you can store them and store them safely? What do we do about the laundry? Again, how, do, how often are we do, do we have to do our laundry more often? How do we manage that? How do we manage, you know, again, our bed sheets, our towels, our clothes? I can tell you personally for me that the work that I've been doing this year in both nursing homes, long-term care facilities, hospitals, but many other facilities, I have outside clothes and inside clothes. I only ever wear my outside clothes outside when I go to work or I have to run an errand or pick up groceries. And I always wear my inside clothes inside and they never go outside. How do we choose our own personal protection equipment? How do we obtain that? Well, luckily I buy most of my personal protection equipment from Amazon, but they don't always have what I want. How do we learn? How do we educate how to clean and disinfect so we can reuse some of this personal equipment? And that's all part of the GBAC STAR program in training that we do for, again, populations, people within our community that are at high risk. How do we choose our own mask, eye protection, eye shield to ensure that at all times when it's needed, we can protect our eyes, nose and mouth? How do we provide that necessary education and training for anyone in our home or within our community? And there are tricks. There are things that we do all the time. So here in my house, when I'm wearing my, ma my, my, my face covering or my mask or my face shield, I use a brown paper bag like this and I will hang them because I have to reuse my personal protective equipment. I'll hang them over the handles to let them to dry so that I, put, I, never, I never put them down on, top, on surfaces to avoid them getting contaminated. And here's another shot. You can see here my, my face mask. I, I, I do work in hospitals. I do wear an N95 respirator. Uh, I have a face shield. I also have uh, um, eye goggles for, for eye protection as well. And when I'm not using them, I'm hanging them over the handles of my brown paper bag. We have to choose our own disinfectant. Cleaning and disinfection equipment. So important now that we read the label first. But what tools or equipment do we put or do we need? to clean that follows those directions that the manufacturer provides us? What choices, who helps us make those choices which are appropriate and safe to use at high frequency inside our house? Because we have many choices to make, but very little guidance on making those choices. And here's just two examples of disinfectants that are on the EPA list N. And if you Google that, EPA list N is so important because that's the list of disinfectants that inactivate or kill the COVID-19 virus. But the challenge we have with labels that hasn't changed is the font size is too small. The directions are too small or too complicated to follow. And it takes a lot of reading and understanding and also education and training to take something that's readily available within our supermarket, readily available for us to buy, but to actually use it properly and safely. And as we choose our own disinfectant, there's a website, but not all of us, know about this website or have access to this website. And again, it's the EPA List N website. And on that website, you can put an EPA registration number. But what is that? Well, the EPA registration number, if I go back to the label, on that label somewhere, and it's not really obvious, but on that label somewhere is an EPA registration number, which shows that this particular product, the chemical in this disinfectant, will inactivate or kill this virus. And you can check to make sure the products you buy at home for home use are ones that work and are effective against the virus. But it's a hard thing to do. And that people need to be trained to do that properly. Dr. Gavin, this is your 10 minute warning. Thank you. So to create a household plan, there's seven things to do. Talk with people who need to be in your plan. Get to know your neighbors. Identify aid organizations or other organizations in your community that can help. Create an emergency contact list and share that list. Choose a room to isolate sick household members, but more importantly, choose a room that's your room, your safe room. Plan how to care, medications, food, fluids, bathrooms, laundry. 
but choose your own personal protective equipment, cleaning and disinfectants, and reach out to those that can help you understand and navigate the, the, the difficult pathway in decision making on what works and what doesn't work. And when you've got your plan together, you need to put your plan into action. And it's important that plans can change. So once you have your plan, you put it into action, don't be afraid to change that plan. More importantly, don't be afraid to call 911 if you have any of the following emergency warning signs for COVID-19. This includes difficult breathing or shortness of breath, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, confusion or ability to arouse, or bluish lips or, or on your face. This list is not all inclusive, but please call 911 or your medical provider if you have any of these symptoms or any other symptoms that cause you concern or are severe. We need to continue practicing our everyday preventive actions. Cough, sneezes and tits. Cough, cover coughs and sneezes with a tissue or into your elbow. Wash your hands often and properly with soap and water. We know that takes about 20 seconds to do it properly. Clean those touch surfaces and objects with soap and water and then use a disinfectant that's on the EPA list end. Read the label. Keep the surface wet for the recommended time. Again, it's on the label. Follow product precautions such as wearing gloves or good ventilation when you're using that product. If possible, use separate rooms and bathrooms for sick household members. If it's not possible, you could put up physical barriers, curtains, shower screens, blankets, plastic sheets. Provide household members that may be sick with clean face masks or face shields. Do not share food, drinks, plates, or utensils. And again, or everyone within your family or your household members should have outside clothes and inside clothes. Our mobile phones are one of the best tools that we have right now to stay in touch, but we could do better by educating both our caregivers, our providers, our patients on how to use them properly, how to set up systems to use them properly, how to stay in touch, how to use them in an emergency. And as I say to all the patients that I work with, it's so important that you should be monitoring yourself for symptoms. Take your temperature twice a day. You should know that your temperature in the morning will be different than it, than it is in the evening. And write this down on a piece of paper. Take care of your emotional health, your anxiety, your worries. Try to find a program that focuses on mindfulness or well-being not just for you, but also for other family members and loved ones. Evaluate the effectiveness of your household's plan of action often. So develop your plan using those seven steps and then evaluate that plan, modify it, change it as required. The reason we do that, because we have real concerns and the Global Biorisk Advisory Council or GBAC, a division of ISA, ISA say, we focus on what are the best, best practices for limiting the likelihood of you getting infected, for focusing on cleaning and disinfection. How can we protect you in your home? How can we help you implement the industry's highest standards for proper procedures, proper training, chemistry, equipment, tools, or personal protective equipment, not just for coronavirus or COVID-19, but for any infectious disease agent? How can we help you provide confidence, trust, and a third party validation to ensure that the levels of cleanliness and disinfection are at a level that does create a safe environment. And the GBAC STAR program is for, really for everyone. And again, we've seen it used in airports, um, stadiums, convention centers, restaurants, hotels, but it also applies within the home. And it's so, so important that we take those same principles and apply them where you live. There are other resources that we have like online courses. We have a GBAC Fundamentals online course that, that, that outlines the appropriate and effective cleaning and disinfection principles based on evidence. It's available in seven languages, English, Spanish, Polish, French, Portuguese, Italian, and Chinese. And it takes about three hours to complete, available at this website at the bottom of the slide. But more importantly, even my team, have, having worked with infectious diseases for many, many years, we train, we educate, and we practice. We practice what we preach inside the home, inside any building. And when we run out of what 
may be recommended by CDC or the World Health Organization, what we need to wear, we go back to our first principles and we look at what's available and we create barriers and we wear protective equipment that works. And it works even here with these ladies that I'm working with in this photo, I provided protective equipment that we know is effective and, work, and works. And our training may not always be conducted inside, so we may be able to do training outside, but our training never stops. Not just our just-in-time training, but we are continually training and repeating our training workshops and exercises on a frequent basis. Because cleaning and disinfecting is both an art and a science. And though in 2019, a lot of the people that we worked with, they, would, they focused on clean and shine, clean and, made things, clean and make things smell good. Now we are cleaning and disinfecting to kill a virus. We all have to become virus killers. We have to do our risk assessments and focus on these high touch points. And here in this photo, you can see we are focusing in a nursing home on those high touch points. The lady in yellow is doing the cleaning and disinfection. The lady in white is helping with the training by observing a visual observation to ensure that what she does is correct. And then she provides praise. You did a great job. And so the person goes and does the same thing the next day and the next day after that. We focus again on those high touch points such as tables. And here we are going through, looking at our protocols and procedures and making sure they're appropriate to kill a virus. And in areas where we think the risk is high for droplet spread, for the spread of the virus, we put up partitions or barriers or shower curtains to capture those droplets to decrease the risk of virus transmission. But what we've also seen that's been really neglected is the increase in waste. As we've cleaned and disinfected more frequently, more often, we've generated more waste. And we're, this is a real weak area that we're focusing on with so many facilities and also people in their homes right now is how to come up with an appropriate waste management plan. Yes, we have to do things more often, but we also have to focus on how to manage that waste much better. Because the challenge we have right now is as business reopen, many of us, if we're cancer patients, or any other patient where our immunity may be not as strong as others, we have to protect ourselves. And as we see businesses reopen, that's good because we have to decrease both the emotional and financial suffering. But for many of us, this pandemic, this risk from this virus and any other virus or bacteria will continue in the future. And our new normal is what we're talking about right now. This is not going to go away. This is something we're going to have to maintain, sustain and be consistent with over time. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact GBAC, the Global Biorisk Advisory Council. Here's our address, the phone number, our website, and our email address. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gavin. You do have two questions in your Q&A. Um, one is, can the airborne virus infect us through the eyes if I'm simply standing in a space not touching my eyes? I can cover my nose and mouth, but my eyes are exposed. Yes. Okay, so we, it's really important we understand how we get infected. And the gateway for this particular virus and other viruses to come in the body, they have to attach to certain receptors. Now, the receptor that the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19, it attaches to what's called an, an ACE2 receptor. And those ACE2 receptors are in your eyes. They're at the back of your throat. And they're in other parts of your body. So it's important that, yes, I would highly recommend that if you're in a situation where there are other people or, or you don't know the disease status or you don't know these people, well, I would actually, you know, when I travel all the time, I'm wearing a face covering as well as a face shield to protect my eyes. The other thing about wearing a face shield or, or something over my eyes, it stops my hands. I'm touching things all the time and putting a face shield on stops me from touching my face with my fingers, and allows me to wash them with soap and water or hand sanitizer and it provides that added level of protection. Fantastic. And the last question is, it starts out with, this is wonderful, thank you. And then moves into, can you address how to safely travel during this pandemic? Many cancer survivors don't live near their families or support systems, and the isolation takes a toll, especially during treatment and holidays, not wanting to take time for granted and quote unquote, waiting things out. 
Yes, I, I think that's a fantastic question. And again, it's so, so important that we come up with solutions that work for each individual. So it's not a, a one size fits all. Um, it's important to understand that if we can travel by car and remain isolated from other people, people that we don't know, that's the best way to travel. Uh, we also have to ensure that if we travel to, to family, loved ones or other people, that we actually have some idea um, of where they've been, have they been sick, do they have symptoms, because that, that's so important. So we have to do constant risk assessments. I'm, I'm, I'm totally convinced that, again, we don't have to lock ourselves in the basement or the attic or in our house. We can be mobile to a certain degree, not extensively, but we have to ensure at all times we protect our eyes, our nose and our mouth, and we wash these hands often with soap and water or hand sanitizer. Again, when I travel on a plane, I'm sitting there all the time on my flight. Don't touch your face, don't touch your face, don't you touch your face. I have my face mask on and I have my face shield on and I do the best to keep my fingers away from my face. Okay, we just had one more come in. This will be the last one. It says, how do you know which masks on Amazon might actually be effective? It's a great question. Uh, when it comes to masks, we've seen this whole new you know, everyone's been so enthusiastic and so um, dedicated to making masks. I would tell you now, a mask sh should be made out of material that does not stretch. And so important. Um, bed sheets make really good masks because the material doesn't stretch. If you're wearing a mask with stretchy material, change it to material that doesn't, that doesn't stretch. Um, with with, with uh, vendors like Amazon and there's other um, vendors out there uh, that sell masks and, and I see ads all the time in social media, Facebook, Twitter, be really careful with that. It's important. I, I go to Amazon because I know when I buy from Amazon, there's a guarantee that that, that product is authentic. It's not fake uh, and it's an authentic product. And, and, I, and I do a bit of research on the specifications, but I want to emphasize there's a lot of people out there that can help cancer, cancer patients make those decisions. But if you're, if you're, yeah, if, if, if someone in your community makes you a mask or you're making yourself a mask, please make it out of material like a bed sheet. It shouldn't stretch. And try to make it with at least two layers. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gavin. And thank you, everyone who attended. We're going to wrap this up right now. All right. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Can I just awesome. say one more thing about the mask? Absolutely. There's one thing you can do. If you put a mask on your face and you want to test whether that mask works or not, I get a piece of tissue paper and I put it close to my face and I blow out. And if that tissue paper moves, that mask, I need to get a better mask. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll put the tissue paper in front of my mask and I'll blow out. And if the tissue paper moves, then I know I need to get a better mask made out of better material. Fantastic. Well, thank you for the advice, Dr. Gavin, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, that concludes our meeting right here. So thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your day. You're very welcome.